But once they invade Brainiac's ship, the plot and the action really jump start. I don't want to say the plot, because it's not the plot, it's just the action. The plot is the long-winded exposition. Hello there heroes, I'm the Orange Ranger, and welcome to what is, technically speaking, the first edition of a comically long review. Now obviously this is just a continuation of a comically long hiatus outside of the hiatus itself, but since we are not in the hiatus anymore, I did need to change the name to something different, and I think this works since my reviews are often comically long, though I am working on that. It's pretty clear that crossovers are all the rage in the world of comics and really fiction in general right now. It seems like no matter how strange the two properties are, how at odds they are to each other's world, there are writers and publishers out there that will make that crossover work. Right now, there is an ongoing crossover at IDW between Star Trek The Original Series and Transformers. Mm-hmm. However, I still have to say that the crossover that I'm reviewing today is one of the more unexpected crossovers we could have gotten. I mean, on its surface, it's actually pretty plain. Two teams of superheroes from different dimensions teaming up to fight common enemies. But I mean, come on, it's the Power Rangers and the Justice League. Who could have seen that coming? Certainly not me. Let's see how the story winds its way to its conclusion by taking a look at Mighty Morphin Power Rangers slash Justice League, issues number four five, and six. I really like this cover. It's a split shot of our villain, Zed and Brainiac, with Z-Putty swarming underneath. My only critique of it is that Brainiac does have his own grunts. We see them in this issue. So why didn't you have both? We pick things back up at CERN in Switzerland as Superman, Cyborg, Billy, Trini, and the CERN scientists discuss what they can do. Of course, it's Billy scribbling down all the formulas. They really paint how smart Billy is as a kind of superpower in this. Anyway, Kim and Zack stand back, not getting any of the science, and Zack worries that his last words to his parents will have been a petty argument. But Kim assures him that they'll have plenty more chances to argue. By the way, Zack and his parents were arguing about him disappearing all the time. Because he's a superhero, I don't really see that as a petty argument on either side. Anyway, they finally reach some kind of a conclusion. Green Lantern grabs the collider, the entire thing, yes, with his ring, and Batman tells him they've all left the facility and will meet him up on the javelin. Ready? Ready. And the two of them lift the collider into outer space. This sheep was very impressed by the feat. Not bad. What? What? They position the collider in space, and then Tommy gives Green Lantern his dragon dagger. I'm not really sure he should be able to have that, seeing as it's an aspect of his powers and he doesn't have his power coin, but we've been seeing in some of the mainline comics that Tommy can have that despite not being morphed, so whatever. And then they do something... From what I can tell, they position the dagger in the middle of the collider, Green Lantern fires it up, and it creates a portal in the middle of the collider. That's not how it works. The Rangers are amazed it worked, though Cyborg points out that if it doesn't work, we've just created a giant, hyper-efficient superhero shredding machine. But Flash says not to worry, he's the only one fast enough to feel them being pulled into pieces. Okay, I guess that makes sense. Being fast has nothing to do with being able to feel things. Or would Flash intentionally speed up to feel that? And why? Anyway, the Javelin flies through the portal and they successfully arrive in the Power Rangers universe. Outside of Angel Grove, surrounded by a glass dome. The Rangers want to fight it. Fight the dome? But the Justice League points out it's not that simple. Brainiac, as you might remember me mentioning last time, collects cities by placing them into domes and shrinking them down. The process is a whole bunch of really crazy physics, so if it's interrupted, the people inside could be torn apart. 
Unfortunately, they're just going to have to let the city shrink, and then they can go save it and enlarge it again. Zack, still feeling guilty, doesn't really like that idea and charges at the dome. And his parents just so happen to have wandered all the way out to the edge of town and see him through the glass running up to him. He begins tearfully apologizing to them, but they say they can't hear him. Um, can he hear them? If not, are the speech bubbles just for us readers then? I mean, either this conversation is absolutely pointless and would have been more powerful without speech, with the two of them just looking at each other, Zack banging on the glass, them just putting their hands on it, saying it's okay, etc., etc. Or this is some kind of weird one-way audio glass. Zack swears that he will save them, and the city shrinks. And now we've circled back to the start of the whole story. Zack feeling guilt, Superman saying it's not his fault, etc., etc. Now that all makes some sense. The Justice League says Angel Grove will have been teleported up to Brainiac's ship, and Jason says the command center in Zordon will be there then as well. Um, from all indications, the command center is a significant distance outside of Angel Grove. How much land did Brainiac grab? Though I guess Lord Zed would specify that he wanted to make sure the command center was taken as well. The Rangers basically say, cool, okay, fine, let's go. Are you kidding? You're powerless. You, they're not powerless. Yeah, okay. Nice exchange. The Rangers are basically like Batman here. No superpowers, but still talented and smart. Batman brings up the bigger problem. You see, Brainiac is an obsessive kind of a collector. When he captures a city, he destroys the planet that it came from. Therefore, he possesses the only city that still exists from that planet. It's like they're mint in box. <laughs> Wendy points out that they need to split up, a strike team for Brainiac's ship and a defensive force for Earth. Batman agrees and says he brought along some things to help, and suddenly we're back on the javelin, meaning that he just held that pause until they got back up onto the ship. What Batman brought is his collection of special weapons, things that the Rangers will be able to use. He invites the Rangers to grab something they like. Jason grabs the Sword of Azrael. If the user has a strong enough will, the sword lights on fire. Zack grabs the Atomic Axe with a blade so sharp it can literally cut atoms in half. Kim finds a bow and a boxing glove arrow. I know it's a bit weird, but no, I get it. It's for when you want to punch someone who's a long way away. It makes perfect sense. This is actually a nice reference to, of all things, the Injustice 2 comic book. When Harley Quinn asked Green Arrow why you'd need an arrow with a boxing glove on it, and, well, that was the answer. Anyway, I guess it doesn't really matter what weapons Billy and Trini picked because it's time to move on to costumes. Yes, Jason realizes that if they save the world just out in plain sight, people might just put together that that group of six in primary colors could possibly be the Power Rangers. They suit up in costumes that I guess Batman just brought along for some reason. Weapons, I understand, but costumes? Now, I'm not huge into DC Comics, but I do know a little, so I want to do this in order of what I recognized right away and what I had to look up. Kimberly is Hawkgirl. Check. I knew Trini was a character that was in Suicide Squad, but I just couldn't remember her name. She is, of course, Katana, and perhaps we didn't see her picking a weapon because the costume makes the choice for the weapon kind of obvious. A Katana. Jason looked a little familiar, but I couldn't quite place it. Maybe it's because his red hood is a little tight for a hood. Yes, he's dressed as Red Hood, a Batman anti-hero slash villain, etc. The other three... I have to be perfectly honest with you, I didn't have a dang clue. Zack went a little old school with his costume, picking Starman. No, no, this Starman actually comes from the old Legion of Superheroes. Interesting choice. 
Since he was kind of half blocked off and wearing a domino mask, I was thinking he might have been Nightwing at first. Anyway, trying to speed this back up, Billy is Prometheus, a resourceful villain with a powerful armor suit and a helmet that can download information directly into his brain. Come to think of it, that's a lot like a Power Rangers suit, actually. And Tommy manages to find a full suit of green armor that was something worn by Lex Luthor in the New 52. Superman tells the team he'll give them all communicators. Batman will lead the strike team, while Wonder Woman leads the defense force. What about Supes himself? I'm the distraction. He flies directly out into space and starts zapping Brainiac's ship with heat vision. Cyborg docks the javelin with the ship and they bust inside. For the record, the strike team is Cyborg, Batman, Billy, and Trini. They fight their way to a major array that Cyborg can hack into, but in the best tradition of video games, it's a protection mission as the Rangers need to keep the Robo Grunts off of his back. Cyborg finds something, not Angel Grove, but the Rangers' morphers. He calls Superman, who has been listening, and Superman sees them. He basically flies directly through the walls while the others keep fighting. Superman tosses Zack the Morphers, Power Coins, and Communicators, hence Superman needing to give them Justice League Communicators. Supes leaves to look for Angel Grove while Zack morphs. I did mention this before, but I have to say it again. This comic series really has a thing for especially showing the Rangers in an in-between morph. It's kind of their version of the morphing sequence. However, his morph is interrupted, I think? by a blast to the chest. The blast came from Cyborg. Cyborg, Vic, if you're in there, I don't want to hurt you. He's in here, but he's mine now. Yes, Cyborg has been possessed, hacked, is being controlled by Brainiac. He blasts Batman too. So I guess the morph was just going very slowly because Billy finally finishes morphing. We see that he picked the trident of the Blue Devil, makes sense, both his lance style weapon and related to somebody with the color blue. So now he has both that as well as his power lance. Billy apologizes for what he has to do and stabs Cyborg through the chest with both weapons, ending issue four. Issue number four gets off to a bit of a shaky start with a bunch of science mumbo jumbo and long-winded exposition in general, but when they get to the part where they invade Brainiac's ship, that's where the action really jump starts. It was fun in a crossover sort of way, seeing the Rangers in the DC costume, seeing who they pick, what weapons they used, etc. And have I already mentioned that I'm loving this art style? I think I have. Issue number four gets a four out of five. Now obviously this is just a continuation of a comically long hiatus outside of the hate. I really like this cover. It's a split shot of our villains, Zen and Bri <laughs> Great, right off the bat. My only critique, cri they really paint how smart Billy is, is as low farts. Batman tells him they've all left the facility and will meet him up on the javelin. Ready? Uh, who's talking? Dagnabbit. Batman tells him they've all left the facility and will beat him up on the javelin. Ready? The Rangers basically say, cool, let's go. Are you kidding? You're, and again, farts, but so, weapons are one thing, but I mean, I'm not really huge in DC com- oh crap. They suit up in costumes that I get- oh god! And a helmet can, that can down- that can- 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 Cyborg docks the jab, jab good friggin' ugh. But in the best transition of tradition, possessed, hacked, is being controlled by, by farts. That was a fun little bit of crossover stuff for both of the franchises. And did I mention I love this art style? <laughs> 